Welcome to the Answers Yes podcast, where we interview some of the most interesting people that have said yes to opportunities in their life. We hope that through these stories, you can learn to create your own destiny by saying yes along the way. Join us as we explore the new series covering topics such as passion, integrity, and hard work. I'm your host, Jim Riley, and I hope you enjoy these interviews as much as I do. I believe that everyone has an important message worth hearing. Hello and welcome to the Answer Yes podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I'm doing two podcasts right now, so I have to second guess my title when I watch it. So I guess that's the challenge of having multiple tasks going on. Hey, if you don't know, this year I am going on speaking tour. I just wrapped up my first one of the year up here in Montana. Had a great time talking about leadership and discipline. And you can catch me later, well, mid-February, two more times here up in Montana. I've been asked to speak some to some organizations. So if you're a company or a business or you've got an event going on, you're looking for a speaker, I'd be love to hear from you. So thank you for that. On Monday nights, I host a group called the Lo- Young Entrepreneur Syndicate. And that's also the title of the other podcast that I do. And we talk about ways to become better entrepreneurs and the tools you need to do that. That also applies to intrapreneurs. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is the thing that we talk about most often is the foundational elements to be successful in those two arenas. And so this year and last year, I've had a number of guests on that are bringing tools and ways that you can learn from them to be stronger in what you're trying to achieve. Again, whether you're an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur. So today I've got Daryl Stickle on the line and I appreciate his time for being here. Thanks, Daryl. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah. You know, um, it's interesting and we're not going to go down the political road because I don't do that on this show. I got another one for that. Uh, but you know, you talk about trust that that's your specialty. And I believe we have lost so much trust and maybe that was stimulated from our political environment or the media or whatever that looks like. I find myself second guessing all the time now. And it's like, how do I find what's right and what's wrong? And I know that that's your specialty. Now, you're probably chopping at the bit to to answer that question. But allow me this. Please give us some of your background first, where things started from you, maybe uh, where you grew up or your first career points until you get to where you're at today. And then let's dive into trust deeply. Yeah. So uh, I was born and raised in a small town in northern British Columbia, Canada. Um. And that community actually taught me a lot in terms of it was fairly isolated. It was it was a small community. We had to collaborate. We had to get along. We had to work together to survive. And it meant that you helped your neighbor if they needed it. And that if if you could, you were helpful. Mm-hmm. And so growing up in that environment and that background, combined with some, you know, some pretty interesting challenges when I was growing up and, and young taught me a level of empathy that may be a bit more than normal for folks. And I went away to school, uh, came to the University of Victoria, and I would find myself sitting on the bus and someone would just sit down next to me and say, I'm really having a hard time. And and so I wanted to understand what it was about me or the way that I showed up in the world that caused people to be comfortable trusting me. Mm -hmm. And you know, initially I started working towards becoming a clinical psychologist and, and I worked with families in crisis and troubled teens and worked on crisis lines and those kinds of things. And then partway through that journey, I came to realize that a lot of the folks I was working with were really just doing the best they could. And even if I could see a path forward for them, they couldn't always take it. Mm-hmm. And so I transitioned. Um Went into public administration, did a master's degree in public admin, was working in native land claims in British Columbia. And they would ask me these deep philosophical questions like, what is self-government? Or what will the province look like 50 years after claims are settled? And the last question they asked me, Jim, was, how do we convince a group of people we've shafted for over 100 years they should trust us? Mm. And I thought, wow, that's a a good question. (laughs) And (laughs) Right? (laughs) So... Yeah. So my first response was maybe it would help if we were trustworthy. Um, I didn't go over nearly as well as one might've hoped. And so I left and went to Duke and doctoral thesis on building trust in hostile environments. 
And uh, once I finished it, I ended up going to work for a large consulting firm called McKinsey and Company. And uh, they they found that I had a good client hands. So they said, you know what? We're going to send you to the worst place possible. Um, and so you know, now I'm getting a chance to apply the concepts that I've been just thinking about and reading about and theorizing about. And, you know, getting some good application. And then two years in, I, I was injured in a car accident on the way to a client site. And I just couldn't work. 80 to hundred hours a week anymore. So ended up starting a small company called trust unlimited. And I've spent about the last 20 years helping people better understand what trust is, how it works and how to build it. Mm. It's interesting because right now in the working environment, you know, up here in Montana, we've had a fair amount. Of, it's changing now the last couple of months, but we've had a fair amount of jobs available in the marketplace and you see people very hesitant to raise their hand for their jobs. And I and I have to wonder, is it because do they trust the company that wants to hire them for what their promises are? You know, you see a $1,500 signing bonus and $1,850 an hour to start and, you know, flexible work schedule. And, and people aren't raising their hands for their jobs. There's, you know, people are still looking for more workers. And I'm wondering if there's a trust factor in there. Have you seen that or would you think that that's the case? So actually, one of the things I've talked about a number of times with companies is creating an environment where people want to be, you know, trust levels lead to higher levels of engagement, um, lower turnover. Uh, it's one of the ways that employers can compete if they can build stronger cultures. Mm -hmm. And I've been approached by a number of companies now uh, asking about, okay, we're growing. How do we maintain our culture? Uh, how do we attract and retain the best people we can find? And the ability to understand trust and build it effectively is one of the core elements that differentiates in a few different ways. For, for companies, especially for leaders. I mean, you talk to entrepreneurs. How do I get folks to engage with me? How do I get them to take a risk on me when there's so many different opportunities or so many different uh, possibilities for them? And you're right, we've seen a more competitive market for labor than we're used to. Um, and that means that, you know, money in and of itself may not be enough to attract right. people. It may be other things as well. Right. So if people are looking for that trust factor to make a decision, what elements of trust are they looking for, especially as it relates to a position in a company you know, I'm thinking about all those companies out there, those leadership um, people that are listening to this show. Focus on what? Is it the guarantee that the work schedule is as flexible as we advertise it, that we're going to train you, that you have longevity here? I mean, there's a number of areas that we can focus on building trust, but what are you seeing as some of the top areas? So trust is a combination of uncertainty and vulnerability. When people are deciding whether to trust someone, they ask themselves two fundamental questions. And the the first question is how likely am I to be harmed, which is perceived uncertainty. And the second question is if I'm harmed, how bad is it going to hurt, which is perceived vulnerability. Mm -hmm. The thing that we seem to have lost, um, you know, with virtual teams and all those kinds of things, is on the uncertainty side. And we've seen massive spikes in uncertainty within organizations and outside of them. You know, so we've seen a pandemic, which has led to rule changes uh, that have varied by region or by country or by state or by company even. And so it, it becomes harder and harder to predict what the rules are going to be. Um, we've seen technology changes, all of those kinds of things. But when I think about uncertainty, it comes from two places, Jim. It comes either from us as individuals or it comes from the context we're embedded in. And, you know, there's a lot of research that talks about those individual components. And there's three levers that they talk about, benevolence, integrity, and ability. And benevolence is the belief you've got my best interest at heart. Integrity is do I follow through on my promises? Do my actions always align up with my values? And abilities, do I have the competence to do what I say I'm going to do? Mm -hmm. All three of those have been shaken when it comes to organizations because ability feels like a moving target. 
um, you know, when we talk about leadership or we talk about organizations, the market seems to be shifting fairly rapidly. And so there's a great deal of uncertainty around who's a good bet. The integrity lever feels harder to pull than it used to be because things are changing so quickly in terms of norms and values and uh, technology and and markets and government regulations and all of those things are moving very quickly. So it's it's harder and harder to make promises that are long term that we can actually follow through on. Mm-hmm. But but I think where we've fallen down the most is benevolence. You know, this belief that okay, you're going to have my interests at heart. Um, and a lot of times that means actually including the other party in the conversation. And, you know, I believe that hiring is a trust decision for both parties. Yeah. And if I'm trying to get a job with you and I show you my resume and I talk about my experience, that's me pulling the ability lever. If I explain how my interests and values line up with what's going to be expected of me or or with the company, that's the integrity lever. But if I actually ask you, what does good look like? How can I help you be successful? What are the challenges that this group or this organization faces? And how can I be helpful? Or what will our roles look like? You know, how will they overlap? What's a good colleague look like? Mm -hmm. Those are ways as a, as a job seeker that I can show benevolence. As an organization, it it becomes, what are your goals and aspirations? How do we help you achieve them? And here's the way that we think about our employees and how we approach that. And we've seen a decline in this because of the sort of virtual teams that we're seeing. You know, we get online, we get face-to-face, we become very focused on getting the work done, less focused on connecting as people. Hmm. Really an important topic. I'm I'm listening intently to you because I'm thinking about some of my clients and like, well, where's what is my role there, right? You know, I I think that benevolence is such an important topic because we forget about that, right? You know, it's about building relationships and being honest and open. And I think that's a topic. If we were bold enough to approach it, we would find much more success. But oftentimes, I don't think we're bold enough to even approach it. So what you're saying is it's acceptable to approach that and and discuss what that looks like. Absolutely. And if I'm an employer and I'm trying to hire someone, I say, look, I want to know what your goals and aspirations are. I want to know what success looks like for you because I want you here for more than six months. I I want you here through the learning curve and beyond. If I'm making the investment and bringing someone on board, I actually want them to be committed to this organization and want to stay. And so that means it's got to be a good place for you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a level of vulnerability with that, right? And and trust is the willingness to be vulnerable when you can't completely predict how someone else is going to behave. Mm-hmm. And we struggle with it. You know, yeah. as, as as leaders, we see leaders now, a lot of them, struggle with the notion of letting go of the things that got them to where they are and stepping into the new responsibilities that are required of them because they're worried about failing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we start trying new things, we're not always great at them and there's a learning curve involved. And so a lot of leaders struggle with that notion of this is what's gotten me to where I am. This is what's made me successful. This is what's allowed me to rise I need to let go of that and let somebody else handle it, even if they're not as good as I am at it. And I need to step into this new level of complexity, these new fronts and frontiers um, and learn how to shine there. And I need to accept that I'm going to make mistakes. We've dabbled around a topic that my mind's swirling right now about bringing some value to employers, especially if they're struggling to bring people in. The speech I gave this weekend was about leadership and encouraging people to run for school board trustee, you know, school boards, basically positions across the county. Right. And the speech itself was effective in motivating people to say, okay, I'll do it, right? Get off your chair and I'll do it. But the questions that I got afterwards, and I think that this is the lesson for employers, is that as you mentioned, people are afraid of messing up or Mm -hmm. not doing a good job or of the unknown. 
And I think as employers, if we could do a better job explaining the process or the expectations or, you know, I don't want to see the ease of the job because everything comes with a little bit of work and, and demand, but making people more comfortable that that would fall in the, the world of trust. Would it not? It absolutely would. And you know, think about you go to the ice cream store and you get a little, little taster, right? Oh, I'm going to try rum raisin. Oh, Hey, I realize I don't like rum and I don't like raisin. <laughs> and thank God I didn't get a whole bowl full of that. Um, and so a lot of times what I suggest, you know, if, if I'm a leader and someone comes to me and says, I'd like to advance within the organization, I'd like to move up the ranks. I start letting them see what that's like before we make that decision. And I say, you know, for me to act in your best interest, then that means I'm going to start holding you accountable to the responsibilities of the next level. Yeah. And that means I'm going to start feeding you some of the tasks and responsibilities that line up with that next level. So that when it comes time for us to promote you, we already know you're good at the job. Well, the same goes for uh, trying to get people on board for different tasks. It's letting them have a little dose of it first. And what you're talking about here, for me, it's uncertainty times vulnerability gives us a level of perceived risk. And we each have a threshold of risk that we're comfortable with. And if we if we go beyond that threshold, we don't trust. And if we're beneath it, then we do. Well, that means that if we've got really high levels of uncertainty, we can only tolerate small ranges of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And as that uncertainty goes down, the range of vulnerability we can tolerate starts to grow. Mm. And so if we give people a little taster, this is what it's going to be like. These are what the expectations are. Here's what the rules are. So I'm going to explain the context to you so that you understand what you're getting into. Now it gets a little easier. Why don't you just come to a meeting and see what the school board does? Um, you know, trustee for school boards is not a popular role right now because of <laughs> some of the challenges that they've been facing, right? To say and the people, least. Yeah. And so people see that and they kind of go, oh, I don't, I don't know if I want to sign up for that. Um, you know, people talking about coming to my home and threatening my family and getting really emotional yeah. uh, about issues. So we, we see a few episodes of that and people start and yeah, not for me. Um, and if you're able to explain to them, okay, those are the outliers and here's the supports we have. If somebody gets out of line and, here's how we clarify what your role is. And, and um, it makes it a lot easier for people to sign up. Yeah, that's for sure. So, you know, you've made some really compelling, you know, points about leadership and how we can approach these things. And, you know, especially school board, <laughs> because that's exactly what people came up with. So I don't want to get attacked. You know, the reality is that that's not, uh, you know, like you said, those are the outliers. You know, I'm also just thinking about the everyday job that's available for our youth that's out there. Right. And, um, you know, as an example, there's there's a brand new Taco Bell restaurant down the street. They're suffering to get employees in the, in the store. Like, who wouldn't want to work at a brand new restaurant, you know, shiny object here, but they're struggling. And I, you know, I can't help but think that people are intimidated by, well, if I if I apply for the job, Will I be able to figure out how to make the food or, or, you know, work the register? It's all computer tech and the pressure of the drive through and all these things. And I believe that if the leaders in those types of organizations could make their applicants feel comfortable, like, hey, we're going to give you the training you need so right. that you're comfortable on the job. And guess what? We're not going to pressure you to know it all in one day. Yes, we need more employees, but we're going to give you the time to be the best you can be. I think that type of messaging will improve the statistics on, you know, people taking these jobs and actually doing it as opposed to being fearful of it. Yeah, I think you're right. And, uh, and being able to say, look, we've got employees who have fun here. Um, and they enjoy working together. It's a collaborative environment. Um, you know, that's, that was a big part of the thing for my son who just took his first job, uh, six months or so ago um, at a small food store. 
right? Mm -hmm. And um, big part of it was his buddies were going to the same place. Now he's there. He's made friends with a lot of folks. It's a nice collaborative environment. You know, I think we're seeing real rises in anxiety yeah. and struggles to engage socially coming out of the pandemic. And people are really uncertain. Yeah. And, and I don't, Daryl, I don't know if you heard this, but um, people are afraid to fail. They're, they're looking for affirmations that they're doing a good job. You mentioned it earlier. It's not always the money. Right. People are afraid to fail and looking for that affirmation and the culture that makes them feel wanted, desired, and they're doing a good job. And I believe that comes from their ability to trust their leadership, right? It's a big part of it. And it's, you know, we interpret the world through stories. Mm -hmm. And a big part of what I do with my sons, who are now 21 and 18, is I've got a relentlessly positive story about them. And it doesn't mean that I never question or that I never hold them accountable, but I always start from a positive perspective. Yeah. And I reinforce that positive story so that there's a safe harbor from which they can take risks. And this is one of the challenges we face today is that, you know, be afraid of, of being judged, uh, being evaluated. And we're seeing this, you know, I, I think that there's there's more anxiety now about being canceled mm -hmm. or uh, vilified or, you know, making mistakes because it seems to get amplified. Yeah. And again, it's these outlier situations, right? It's the same struggle that you're seeing with getting people to sign up for school boards. Um, it's, I haven't been engaged with people for two years I've done most things virtually and when it's virtual, I can turn off the computer and they go away. Uh, if I'm there, I actually, you know, maybe I'm stuck. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and, you know, people ask me why, like we have some of the lowest trust levels we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And it's because uncertainty has been spiked so dramatically uh, and vulnerability hasn't gone down. Right. We still yeah. have the same vulnerabilities. Yeah. Um, and so your instincts are really good, Jim. It's it's how do we reduce uncertainty for them? And how do we take steps to reduce vulnerability so that they're comfortable taking small steps? Um, you know, so with a place like the Taco Bell, can they can they offer prospective applicants a tour or a chance to talk with folks about what a day in the life is like? Sure. Um, you know, do some outreach. Uh, go to high schools and say, Hey, this is what your shifts would look like, and this is what you do during that shift. And here's what my experience was. Um, you know, one of those things where they start to reduce the uncertainty and they reduce the vulnerability, right? Mm. No one's going to run themselves through a meat grinder. Um, you know, you're not going to get shot in a drive by at the drive through, um, <laughs> not here in Kellis Bell. <laughs> no, and so. So, you know, it's it's one of these things where you try to reassure people. We didn't have to do this as frequently before because on certain levels weren't quite as high. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we need to be more intentional about how we build these relationships. And that's what I tend to focus on. It's interesting. When I read your bio before we scheduled this show, it's been weeks now. I didn't put as much weight into the topic of the conversation. Trust has always been important to me, right? And I and I realized, yeah. hey, this would be something good to talk about. But as we're speaking today, and I really hope people are picking up on this, is that there is so much that we can do to build around trust, have better organizations, better family units, better friendships. Yep. I mean, the list goes on. I know you sent me a list or your team did on your bio, but it's often overlooked. So I, I love that we've taken the time to talk about these things. Now you've written a book. Yeah. Well, can you share the title and a little bit about what's in the book? Because maybe they can get some more than what we're given on this show today. Yeah. The, the book's called building trust, exceptional leadership in an uncertain world written mm -hmm. by you know me, Daryl stickle. Um, and really I found that I was having really profound impact 
but it felt like I was dropping small grains of sand in the ocean. And I wrote the book to spread the word as broadly as I could. Um, so in the book, I talk about why trust matters. And then I talk about the trust model in full detail. And then I talk about how do we actually pull those levers? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there are 10 levers we can pull to build trust. Um, we each have the ability to build trust, but some are better than others. And so those who aren't very good have a lever that they pull. Those who are better have multiple levers. And those who are really good have multiple levers and they know when to pull which one. Mm. And so in the book, I go through the 10 different levers. I talk about how to pull them. Uh, I give some case studies and some examples. I tell a lot of stories. And it's a lot of people are talking about trust, but they're not talking about what to do about it. And I have a very practical applied approach. Just like you're saying, Jim, there's there's things we can do tomorrow, next week. You know, um, I've had the experience of having fathers talk to me about being alienated from their sons mm -hmm. on multiple occasions. And I got to tell you, I'm 100% so far in changing that. Um, and, you know, explain to them how to engage, how to be more intentional, how to connect. Uh, has profoundly changed their relationship with their sons, their ability to connect with them and 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 be there for them. That relationship is so important. And I want people to not just buy the book, but read the book and start applying it. Um, because you know we're the world is filled right now with with what I call big hairy problems, things like climate change, things like race relations, things like political divides, you know, that you were talking about before, things like changing norms and values, uh, relationships between countries, gender even, right? And so we're having all of these profound disputes that require collective collaborative action to, for us to resolve. Mm. And here we sit with the lowest trust levels we've ever seen. Yeah. And so I wrote the book to try to have broader impact than just me talking to people. Well, I can see why people have gravitated towards you your entire life <laughs> to ask your thoughts on the matter. My wife's the exact opposite of your approach, but she often finds herself being the recipient of somebody else's problems. And, you know, she's the confident, right? <laughs> and she's right. What, what do I do, Jim? I said, well, uh, take it as an honor and be uh, truthful and honest with them and protect, you know, their secrets and what they've shared with you, you know? Right. But uh, I certainly can see what the attraction is to speak with you, Daryl. And, and I think what you're doing is wonderful. I could, and I've said this with some other guests, I could talk to you all day about this. I, I again, and I've, I've said this about a couple of shows in the last 12 months, I think because we're hitting a stride here, this could be one of the more important topics that we've covered on this show because so much extends out of trust and the tools that you're talking about, that your book talks about the tools to build that yeah. in your relationships, in your leadership, in your teams and how you approach things is so critical in this environment. And I, I did not realize it until we started speaking today. I'm a strategist by nature. I'm going, if people applied this, if they applied, right. this, could see the change that would happen you know, you talked about days, you know, weeks, months, within moments, yeah. this can change how things are being done. Yeah. And and it's one of the things that really differentiates, you know, I've worked with leaders from all over the world. Um, it's one of the things that differentiates between a leader who's just okay and one who's exceptional. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with families. Uh, it has a profound impact on our relationships with our spouses, with our kids, with our neighbors, with our friends. Um, it's, it's so elemental to us engaging as human beings and it's frayed right now, but we can be intentional about building it. Yeah. And that's, that's the message I really want people to get is that it isn't just what it is. It's, it's something we can work on no matter how poor or good you are at building trust. It's a skill that you can get better at. Well, this is the perfect time to wrap, but I, I'm going to pull the bonus question. <laughs> whatever, okay. Whatever the other hosts say, because I was just thinking, you know, 
if we've encouraged people to build this trust, right, and, and to act with intention on building trust, whatever th- whatever that looks like for you in whatever arena, home or business, what would you say to the recipients about being willing to trust? What is your advice to them? Yeah, and and one of the challenges that we see in the world right now is that uh, there's a reluctance to be vulnerable. Mm. And Brene Brown talks about this. Um, you know, if we go first, if I go first and make myself a little bit vulnerable, it initiates a norm of reciprocity in you. You start to think, well, if Daryl can tell me certain things about himself, then I can share things about myself. And it can create this virtuous cycle. And so if we want someone to open up and, and connect with us, then we need to demonstrate that. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, you and I connected before the show even started. We started talking about backgrounds and where we're from, and and we found overlaps of interest. And um, and that started this nice virtuous cycle and allowed us to have a great conversation today. Yeah. And so part of that is, you know, and, and I'm, I'm lucky because I've got, I'm legally blind. I've got a guide dog named Drake who wanders the world with me and just engages everybody. Hmm. And so, and they, they see me being potentially vulnerable and most of society reacts. It's a good way to separate people. Um, and so my encouragement is, you know, if you want someone to open up and be vulnerable, go first. Perfect. Great advice. All right. I am going to wrap there because I could go all day. Love the topic. You can find more at trustunlimited.com. Trustunlimited.com. I'll put that in the show notes. I'll put Daryl's bio there and his book. And uh, I really take this message to heart because I think it's important. I think it'll change your life at home. And I think it will change. Well, I don't think I know it will change your life at home and I know it will change your business life. So please uh, take note here. What a wonderful show, Daryl. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Jim. Thank you for listening to today's show. It is my pleasure and honor to interview all of the guests that have been on the answer is yes podcast. If you have enjoyed the show, please go on iTunes and subscribe, give a rating or simply tell a friend about the show. We also believe in the message of our guests and the positive influence of their stories. As my own mentor and coach, David Meltzer, has taught me, spend some time every day thinking and writing about the things in your own life that you have more than enough of. You will find out how blessed we really are. Please visit my website, livelifedriven.com, for the latest updates about me and what I'm doing. Plus, I post a monthly blog about the many topics on this show. This podcast can also be found there. As I learned early on in life, what you believe is what you will achieve. Thanks, Mark Victor Hansen, and thank you, and have a great week.